Well, thank you very much, Aaron, for that introduction. As a physician, I'm interested in people. So my series of talks on this voyage are going to be mainly about famous people. And today I'm going to tell you about the lives of three artists from what is now Italy, although at the time they lived, Italy was made up of independent city-states. And their lives pretty well spanned the time of at least the last 75% or more of the Renaissance in Italy. So I'm going to start with Michelangelo Buonarroti. He was born in Caprese, about 60 miles east of Florence, and he was baptized in this church, the Church of St. John the Baptist. But within a month, the family had moved to a high, dank house near the Basilica of Santa Croce in Florence. And Michelangelo was given to a wet nurse in nearby Settignano, where the Buonarroti family had a small farm and a quarry. And the wet nurse was the daughter of a stonemason and the wife of a stonemason. And Michelangelo claimed in later life that he'd absorbed the hammer and chisel along with the mother's milk. He had some schooling, but early biographers suggest that he tended to skip school to watch artists at work. But he obviously had some schooling, as this is a letter from him when he was in his early 30s, when he was living in Rome, a letter to his father. And you can see the handwriting is absolutely beautiful. It's not really compatible with someone who had limited schooling. When he was 13 years old, he was apprenticed to Domenico Ghirlandiao. And the apprenticeship only lasted two years, but it was useful because Ghirlandiao had just started painting these frescoes in the church of Santa Maria Novella in Florence. The following year, when he was 14, he was allowed to study the antiquities in the garden of Lorenzo de' Medici. And the antiquities were curated by an old sculptor, Bertoldo. And here, Michelangelo learned to model in clay. Now, one of the carvings in the garden was the head of a fawn, and Michelangelo begged a piece of marble and a chisel from one of the masons, and he copied it. And the copy was so fantastic, that the, and Lorenzo admired it so much, that he took Michelangelo into his house to be tutored. And this is a painting of the scene, as imagined some 240 years later. His tutor in the household was Adriano Poliziano, who was a philosopher and the tutor to the Medici family, and seen here with Giuliano de Medici. And Poliziano told Michelangelo all about centaurs. And Michelangelo then carved a relief of a battle between centaurs and men, managing to hide most of the centaurs' horse bodies, because he wasn't very good at that stage at carving horses. And in a way that would become characteristic of his work, he didn't actually finish this carving. Another early work, when he was about 16, was this low relief called the Madonna of the Steps. But even this wasn't completely finished. But the carving was in the style of Bartoldo's tutor, the great sculptor Donatello. After Lorenzo de Medici died, his successor Piero was not that interested in art, so Michelangelo returned to his father's house. He wanted to study human anatomy, and he arranged to carry out dissections at this hospital, the Hospital of Spirito Santo. And to say thank you, he's thought to have carved this wooden crucifix for the prior. He left Florence in 1494, possibly because of uh, political instability. And he then went first to Venice and then to Bologna, where he had a commission to carve three small statues. This one of St. Proculus, this one of St. Petronius holding a model of Bologna, and an angel holding a candelabrum. And these were all done before he was 20 years old. After a winter spent back in Florence, he carved a small cupid, which is now lost, which one of the Medicis suggested should be sent to Rome, where it would be taken for an antique, which would be considered more valuable than the new one. And this is at a time in Rome when Greek statues were very highly prized and modern ones weren't. And the cupid was bought by Cardinal Riario. And Riario and other cardinals had collections of antiquities, and Rome was littered with antique monuments and sarcophagi. So Michelangelo went to Rome as well. And he carved the statue of Bacchus for the cardinal, but Riario wanted his money back when he realized it was new and not an antique. And it found its way into the garden of one of the cardinal's friends, Jacobo Galli, uh, but it had its right hand and the penis broken off to make it look like an antique. And the hand with the goblet was restored in the 1550s. In 1498, 
Michelangelo was commissioned by this cardinal to create a sculpture for his tomb in the chapel of Santa Petronilla in the old St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. That's highlighted in red in the top left-hand corner. The result was the Pieta, and that we heard about yesterday with Fenella's talk. It was moved into the modern basilica of St. Peter in the 18th century. And the story goes that someone asked who sculpted it in Michelangelo's hearing, and he was told, the person who asked was told it was Cristofo, uh, Cristoforo Solari. And Michelangelo was so annoyed that he carved, Michelangelo of Florence made this on the sash running across Mary's chest. It was the only work that he ever signed, and the Vasari wrote later that Michelangelo regretted his outburst of pride and he swore never again to sign another work. As a result of his connections with Galli and Riario, he was commissioned to paint a panel showing the entombment of Christ for the brothers of Sant'Agostino, but it remained unfinished, and Michelangelo returned the money he'd been paid for it. He went that, then went back to Florence for a commission he also didn't finish, but when he was there, he was commissioned by Piero Soderini, the then de facto ruler of Florence, to make a statue out of a block of marble that had been lying around in the cathedral workshop yard for some 40 years. He produced drawings for the statue, along with the words you see here, which translated are David with the sling and I with the bow, Michelangelo. And the bow may refer to the simple type of then, a drill then in use by sculptors. And the result was, of course, David. Michelangelo drew a face on the slab and then carved back from that. And this was his usual technique. And Vasari um, compared it to the gradual emergence of the figure from the marble block to a model that sunk underwater and then slowly pulled up, revealing the topmost parts first and then part by part the rest. And this is a technique shown in his later unfinished carving of St. Matthew. But for the statue of David, Michelangelo was limited by the block of marble. Firstly, it wasn't deep enough, and secondly, it had a flaw. And the result is a statue that's best viewed from the front. And previous sculptors had, had shown David after his victory, but Michelangelo chose the apprehension before the fight. And as the art historian Hibbard pointed out, the oversized right hand, which bothered me for years, probably refers to the description Manu Fortis, strong hand, frequently applied to David in the Middle Ages. In 1910, the statue of David had been exposed to the elements for a long, long time. It was deteriorating. And the statue you now see in front of the Palazzo della Signoria um, is a copy. And the real one was transferred to the Academia Gallery to prevent further deterioration. His next major sculpture was the Bruges Madonna, finished in 1505, so-called because it's in a church in Bruges. And work on this one meant leaving another round relief, the, the Tade Tondo, unfinished. But that one is interesting because it shows Michelangelo's sculpture work at various stages of finish. His next contract was for the carving of 12 apostles. But this was cancelled because a, a more important commission had come in, one that was to occupy him off and on for the next 36 years, the tomb of Pope Julius II. It was going to be freestanding and enormous, and Michelangelo made many plans, one of which was chosen by Julius. But the Pope's eye was on another ball, the building of the new St. Peter's Basilica, and Michelangelo went back to Florence. And to signal that his return there was permanent, he bought a house, which was rebuilt in the next century as a museum, La Casa Buonarroti. But it wasn't to be because he was recalled to Rome by the Pope. And until now, Michelangelo had been thought of as mainly as a sculptor. But now the Pope wanted to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, seen here from the outside. The ceiling at that stage was designed to look like the heavens with a, a myriad of stars. But Michelangelo tried to refuse the commission over and over again. Finally, he agreed, and he started work in May 1508 for a fee of 3,000 ducats. That's about $78,000 in today's money. He tried to hire assistants to speed along the work, but he couldn't find any suitable candidates, and he ended up painting the entire ceiling himself. And this is part of a, a, a poem he wrote, satirizing his painting with a caricature of himself painting the ceiling. And it includes the words in translation, my beard towards heaven, I feel the back of my brain upon my neck. My brush above my face continually makes it a splendid floor by dripping down. I'm not in a good place, and I'm no painter. 
It's thought that after a lot of discussion, the Pope gave him carte blanche to do as he liked. And this is the resulting uh, scheme of scenes from the Old Testament. And the work took him four years. And I highlight one panel to show you later how restoration has changed it. And this is the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. These are the before and after pictures after the uh, recent restoration, which took 10 years from 1979. But there were obvious, obviously restorations before this. Initial problems were caused by water penetrating from above. And in 1547, the ceiling was being damaged by saltpeter, which left a, a white efflorescence on the painting. And early conservators treated this with linseed or walnut oil, which made the crystalline deposit more transparent. In 1625, Simone Laghi, the resident gilder, as he was called, wiped the ceiling with linen cloths and cleaned it by rubbing it with bread. He occasionally had to wet the bread to remove the more stubborn deposits. He almost certainly applied layers of glue varnish to revive the colours, but he didn't record this in his report in order to keep the restorer's trade secrets secret. And this is the before and after of the um, temptation and expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. Before 17, between 1710 and 1713, Annabale Matsuoli and his son carried out a further restoration. They used sponges dipped in Greek wine to remove the grime caused by soot from the candles and dirt trapped in the oily deposits for the earlier restorations. Matsuoli then strengthened the contrasts by overpainting details and applying a lot of glue varnish. And many people believe that the most recent restoration has gone too far, and you can judge for yourselves from the last few slides whether or not it has been a success. On the one hand, the colours are certainly now more vibrant, but on the other hand, some details have been lost, such as the eyes from the spandrel showing Jesse. And some people have even interpreted the, the, the picture of God creating Adam as a depiction of the human brain. And of course, Michelangelo was familiar with anatomical dissection. And the American doctor, Frank Meshberger, hypothesized that the embedded image of the brain in the creation of Adam shows God not only giving Adam life, but also intelligence. Uh, the School of Athens is a, a fresco by Raphael, painted roughly the same time in one of the uh, Raphael rooms in the Vatican. And the fresco has a picture not in Raphael's original drawing, that of Heraclitus, which is thought to be a portrait of Michelangelo. When Pope Julius II died, he left money to continue his tomb, and a new contract was drawn up, changing the freestanding tomb into a wall-mounted one. And Michelangelo now started three years of frenetic work, including these two statues, which are now in the Louvre, and four others, probably carved about 1519. Now, these four statues, as Hibbert put it, imprisoned in their blocks of stone, stood in the cave of the Baboli Garden for a long time, but they were moved to the Academia in 1908. And Michelangelo himself always referred to these statues with the word prisoners, and not the word slaves, as modern art historians refer to them nowadays. But these, together with the two in the Louvre, were intended for the tomb of Julius II, but were never completed. He also did a massive figure of Moses for the tomb. And the horns on the forehead come from, probably come from a mistranslation of the Hebrew for rays of light. The Jewish karan, which is rays, may have been confused with keren, which is horns. And the tomb was finally finished with the help of assistance in 1547 after 36 troubled years. And it's now in the church of San Pietro in Vincoli in Rome. Although Pope Julius II is buried with the other popes in St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. Michelangelo's work on the tomb had been falling behind and Florence was now ruled again by the Medici's, Pope Leo X's younger brother, Giuliano de' Medici. And the Pope decided to beautify Florence by giving the Medici church there, San Lorenzo, a new facade. And Michelangelo made drawings and even a wooden model, but there were delays in quarrying the marble and the contract was cancelled after four years. So he spent the next few years working on the Medici chapel with the tombs of Giuliano on the left and Lorenzo on the right, as well as designing the Medici library on the upper floor of the San Lorenzo complex in Florence. In 1537, he returned to Rome and was honored by formally being made a citizen. He drew designs for the development of the Capitoline Hill, and although he died before the Piazza del, del Campignoli was even started, and it wasn't finished until the 1700s, the scheme pretty well followed his wishes. However, 
Pope Clement VII decided he wanted a painting on the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel to show the Last Judgment, probably to warn believers what would happen if they followed the new Reformation. And although Michelangelo wasn't keen, the new Pope, Paul III, was a keen lover of art, and more importantly, he was already a patron of Michelangelo. Uh, this is the opposite end, which did look the same as the one that Michelangelo was being asked to paint. So first the old paintings and the plaster had to be removed and the windows blocked in before Michelangelo could even start. He was now in his 60s and feeling his age, and it took four years to paint the higher levels before the scaffolding could be moved down. But the result was spectacular. As was his custom, though, Michelangelo originally painted all the figures nude. But in 1564, the Council of Trent ordered that fig leaves or loincloths should be added, and St. Catherine had a green dress painted on. The central figure is the Son of God driving the wicked from him. And in general terms, those on the right are being driven down to hell, while those on the left are rising up to heaven. But one man, who was the master of ceremonies for the Vatican, one man called Minos, uh, made the mistake of criticizing the work as it was in progress. So Michelangelo included him, painted with ass's ears and a large snake biting him in a very tender part. And St. Bartholomew, who was martyred by being skinned alive, is holding a flayed skin, but the face of the flayed skin is that of Michelangelo himself, possibly reflecting what he felt like at that time. The painting was finished in 1541 when Michelangelo was 66. And in the next few years, he continued working on the Pope Julius' tomb, two frescoes for the Capella Paolina in the Vatican, and as an architect, his designs for the Capitoline Hill, the Palazzo Farnese, the Cupola of St. Paul's Basilica, and the Porta Pia in the city wall, built from 1561 to 1565. By now, at the age of 89, he was nearing death, although he was still carving within a week of his dying, and he dictated his will in three sentences, leaving, as recorded by Vasari, his soul to God, his body to the earth, and his, near and his material possessions to his nearest relations. And although he died in Rome, the Medicis decided he should be buried in Florence, so they smuggled his body out of Rome, supposedly rolled up in a carpet and took it back to Florence, and the tomb itself took 14 years to complete. More than anything else, though, Michelangelo the sculptor is remembered as Michelangelo the painter of the Sistine Chapel. And now I want to talk about an artist who created what could be called the most ignored painting in the world. Not this one, this is a self-portrait painted when he was about 30. He was born in Verona, which is where the name Veronese comes. His father was a stonecutter, and his mother was the illegitimate daughter of a nobleman, Antonio Cagliari. So he called himself Paolo Cagliari professionally, hoping that the link to the aristocracy would help his career. And this is a, a painting of what Verona looked like at the time. To start with, Veronese was ap apprenticed to his father, so he was known as Paolo Spezza Preda, Paolo the Stonecutter. But he showed a talent for drawing, so at the age of 14 he was transferred to the workshop of a local painter, Antonio Bedili, who's not, I have to say, a terribly distinguished painter. This is his martyrdom of St. Sebastian. And some art historians claim that Veronese also studied in the workshop of Giovanni Francesco Corotto, from whom he got a love of colour. And this is Corotto's surprisingly modern-looking red-headed youth holding a drawing that could be done in any nursery school nowadays. This is one of Veronese's earliest known works, The Conversion of Mary Magdalene, dating from when he was between 17 and 20 years old. And another early painting, painted about the same time, still showing the influence of Bedile, is this altarpiece, which is a fifth, um, a, an oil-on-canvas painting uh, commissioned by a family for the chapel in Verona. But at the age of 24, he left Verona for Venice, and he was soon getting commissions. By 1553, he had painted the ceiling of the Hall of the Council of Ten, and others in the Doge's Palace, including the punishment of the forger on the left, and Juno showering gifts on Venice on the right. But the work I want to spend most time on had its origin here, the Basilica of San Giorgio Maggiore in Venice, which was building a new refectory. This was an oblong room about 30 meters long, but had only been built up to the height of its windows before the architect Palladio arrived in 1560, and he gave the rather ordinary room a classical cornice and cross vaulting. The monks then commissioned Veronese in 1562 to do a painting for the end wall for 
the equivalent of $1,500 in today's money, plus board and lodging and a barrel of wine. Helped by his brother Benedetto Cagliari, Veronese did the painting in 15 months, and the result was the wedding feast at Cana. And this painting is huge. It's 32 and a half feet wide and 22 feet high. And it shows the biblical story of the wedding at Cana in which Jesus converted the water into wine. Mounted on the end wall of the refectory, it looked as if the wall wasn't there, extending the view to the outside. In 1797, Napoleon plundered the picture as war booty and tr transported easily. It was cut in half and rolled up uh, to be sewn together again in, in France at the Louvre, seen here at about the right time. And during the Franco-Prussian War, the painting was stored in a box in Brest, in Brittany, and in the Second World War, it was rolled up again for storage and taken to hiding places throughout the south of France, just in case the Italians reclaimed it or it was looted by the Nazis. In 1989, the painting was restored rather controversially. Uh, for instance, the red garment of the house steward was removed to reveal the original green underneath. During restoration, the canvas was spattered with rainwater from a leak, and then two days later, the one and a half ton painting was being raised when a support frame collapsed, and in falling to the floor, the metal framework holding the painting tore the canvas, resulting in five punctures and tears up to three feet long. Luckily, these didn't affect any of the faces. Meantime, despairing of ever getting the painting back, a digital replica of the wedding feast at Cana was installed on the refectory wall at San Giorgio Maggiore. So why is the original so ignored nowadays? Well, this lady is to blame, the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. And you can see the attention that La Gioconda attracts in the Louvre. Unfortunately, she's mounted on the back of this dividing screen, so it's opposite the Veronese, which you can see at the back, and most people don't turn around to see this. And if you can imagine the figures in the foreground being life-size, then you get some idea of the scale of the painting. In the painting, most historians agree that the feast has reached almost to the end, with the guests enjoying nuts and quinces, a pear-like fruit, for dessert, which serves as a reminder that bitterness as well as sweetness are mixed in a marriage. Each guest, though, appears to have a full, unused place setting next to them. But for the wine to have run out, as in the Bible story, the meal must have been well advanced. On the left... A servant is de demonstrating an empty urn, while on the right, another is pouring out the replenished wine. So Veronese combined these two episodes into one scene, which brings to mind the, the grace that I first heard at the Royal College of Physicians, which goes, Lord of Cana, Lord Divine, who turned the water into wine, look down upon us foolish men who try to turn it back again. So in the painting, Christ is seated in the middle with his mother Mary, together with some apostles, in what is thought to be the clothing worn in biblical times, but the rest of the guests are in 16th century Venetian clothes. And above Christ is a reference to the sacrifice he will make in the years to come, where a butcher is carving up what most art historians agree is a lamb, making reference to Jesus as the Lamb of God. Another indication of Christ's impending fate is seen in the hourglass in front of the musicians, who are themselves worthy of note, because Veronese painted himself and other notable Venetian artists in the picture. He painted himself in white, playing the tenor viola. Diego Ortiz, a Spanish master viola player in green, playing the melodic bass viola. Bassano, playing the cornetto. Tintoretto, in blue, playing the, so playing the soprano viola. And Titian, in red, on the viola da gamba, or double bass. And bearing in mind that this is a wedding feast, the principles aren't in the place of honour, because that's given to Jesus because of what he's going to be. The groom is at the end of one of the table legs. The man with the black beard is the bridegroom, Don Alfonso Davalos, and the lady sitting next to him is his wife, Vittoria Colonna, and she's the sister of King Francis I of France, who's sitting beside her in blue. And other people supposedly identified, although Veronese is not likely to have known what they looked like, are the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, Eleanor of Austria, Mary Tudor, that's Queen Mary I of England, and Suleiman the Magnificent, who is likely to be the bearded man in gold between the, what is likely to be the Ottoman ambassador to Venice and the lady in blue using the toothpick. And while many of the figures in the picture interact with, her, uh, with one another, only the servants appear to be speaking, and this is to comply with the code of silence observed by Benedictine monks in the refectory where the painting was to hang. 
And amongst the 130 people, uh, people depicted, Veronese also included his brother, who had helped to paint the picture, Benedetto Cagliari as the wine steward examining the new wine. But it wasn't just paintings on canvas with lots of people. Here are two frescoes at the Villa Barbero, completed in the late 1550s. But he really did prefer painting people. And his love of ornament got him into trouble with the Inquisition in 1573, when he was interrogated about a painting of the Last Supper that he'd crowded with people such as a buffoon with a parrot on his wrist, a servant with a nosebleed, dwarves, and what the Inquisition called other vulgarities. Veronese replied, I received the commission to decorate the, figure, uh, the picture as I saw fit. It's large, and it seemed to me it could hold many figures. He was ordered to change the painting, but instead he simply changed the title of the painting from The Last Supper so that it represented a less solemn meal, the feast in the house of Levi. He was now able to set up a workshop with his sons and his brother and live in this house, the Palazzetto del Veronese in Venice. Where his paintings included this portrait of a sculptor in 1575, later in the Swan, ten years later, and the Assumption two years after that. And having reverted to his name of Paolo Cagliari, he died 12 years uh, later, that 1587, uh, of pneumonia, aged 60. And he's buried in the church of San Sebastiano, which houses a lot of his paintings, including the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And now we turn to the bad boy of Italian painting, which is why I'm wearing a tie with a black sheep on it. The artist was the first child of Fermo Marisi and his second, child, uh, his second wife, Lucia Aratori. And he was born on the feast of St. Michael the Archangel, so he was christened Michelangelo Merisi. His birth was registered in Milan, where his father was a stonemason. And when he was five, the city was hit by bubonic plague, and the family fled from Milan to Caravaggio. And despite this, the deaths are recorded there of his father, his paternal grandparents, and his uncle soon afterwards. So by the time he was six, he had lost almost every male member of his family. But as he spent his formative years in Caravaggio, he was later known as Michelangelo from Caravaggio, or just Caravaggio. Caravaggio's maternal aunt was wet nurse to the children of Francesco Sforza and his wife Costanza Colonna. And the Sforzas and Colonnas were amongst the most influential and powerful families in Italy at the time. And Caravaggio's connections to them would prove vitally important in later life. At the age of 12, he signed a contract of apprenticeship with a minor Milanese master artist, Simone Perezzano, a former pupil of Titian. But given that Caravaggio never actually mastered Perezzano's specialty of fresco painting, he may not have been a very diligent apprentice. At the time, Milan was dominated by the preaching of its archbishop, who was violently anti-Reformation. He regarded the poor as the living images of Christ, and he favoured art that was plain and robust, rather than the high Renaissance style that was the vogue at the time. And his views had a significant impact on Caravaggio's art. However, Caravaggio had a short temper and a penchant for getting into trouble. And after allegedly wounding, and some sources say killing, a police officer in a fight, he had to flee Milan in 1592 at the age of 21, and he went to Rome. He was almost penniless. To start with, he, job, he lodged with a jobbing painter from Sicily, where he painted three heads a day for absolute peanuts. Then he lodged with a priest, Pandolfo Pucci, but he was given nothing but salad to eat in the evening, and Caravaggio was nothing but a, a red meat man. He then worked for a painter from Siena, Antiveduto Grammatica, before moving to the studio of Cavaliere d'Arpino, otherwise known as Giuseppe Cesare, who was one of the foremost uh, painters in Rome at the time. There was a strict hierarchy in artist studios at that time, with only the most able being allowed to paint faces. And the lowest grade had to do borders, fruit and flowers, and that was what Caravaggio was employed to do. And this is one of his early paintings. When you think that out of a total, total population of 100,000 in Rome, there were 2,000 artists living and working there. So you can imagine that competition for places in artist studios and for commission was absolutely fierce. It's thought that he painted this self-portrait as Bacchus as a demonstration piece to show Cesare that he deserved more than fruit and flowers. But he was kicked by a horse and admitted to the hospital of Santa Maria della Consolazione, leaving Cesare's workshop after only eight months. 
He painted a number of self-portraits at this time, including this boy bitten by a lizard in a bowl of flowers and fruit. And the subject was intended to interest sophisticated collectors. Here's a, a young man in a state of undress, picking at a bowl of fruit and is startled by a lizard that bites his finger. And the painting may have implied the punishment that for follows immoral behaviour, with the snapping lizard symbolising the pain of venereal disease. With a local dealer, he planned to attract the attention of a well-known collector by showing paintings in the dealer's window. And one was the card sharps, where a wealthy young man is being fleeced by two rogues. One has spare cards behind his back, while the other is signalling what cards the victim has in his hand. And the holes in that man's gloves were also used to feel for marked cards. The second painting was the fortune teller, where the victim's palm is being read while the fortune teller slips the ring off his finger. But the ploy was successful. The pictures were bought by Cardinal Francesco del Monte and he became Caravaggio's patron, obtaining many commissions for him and even giving him board and lodging in the Palazzo Madama. Del Monte was a music lover and this painting by Caravaggio of musicians rehearsing hung in his music room. You can see a, a self-portrait in the background. In addition, he painted devotional works for other Roman noblemen in Del Monte's circle, including the rest on the flight into Egypt in 1595. Joseph is holding the music up for the angel, and the words have been deciphered as quam pulcra est et quam decora, how beautiful and fair you are, which is from the Song of Solomon. And the music has been identified as from a, a, a Franco-Flemish a composer, Noel Baldovine, uh, who was known throughout Italy at the time. This is what that music sounds like. Del Monte was ambassador for the Medici family in Florence and they supported the cost of his Roman residences. And encouraged by Del Monte, Caravaggio painted Bacchus for the Medici Grand Duke of Tuscany. Now Bacchus has been interpreted as a male prostitute in down at heel lodgings offering a glass of wine to a prospective client. But it's also been described as Bacchus in the guide of a precursor of Christ, offering the pleasures of eternal salvation. And this contrast typifies what Cardinal Ottavio Paravicino wrote about Caravaggio as working in the middle area between the sacred and the profane. Caravaggio also associated with Rome's prostitutes and courtesans, especially Philide Melandroni, who served as a, a model for a number of pictures painted in the late 1590s, and whose pimp was one Tomassoni, whom we'll meet later. It was illegal for women to model for painters in Rome at the time, so employing a prostitute was one way of getting around the law. And this is the painting of Martha and Mary Magdalene. She also featured in the rather startling Judith beheading Holofernes in a scene from the Apocrypha, and St. Catherine of Alexandria. Now, these works differed from contemporary ones in two ways. Firstly, he used live models instead of using his imagination, and this makes the figures appear much more natural. And he also developed his characteristic use of light and dark, chiaroscuro, and this is why so many of his backgrounds appear dark. But the rise in his fortunes also marked his first appearances in the criminal archives of Rome for assault, and what we would now call a fray. He was described to a court in the following words. This painter is a stocky young man with a thin black beard, thick eyebrows and black eyes, who goes all dressed in black in a rather disorderly fashion, wearing black hose that is a little bit threadbare and who has a thick head of hair long over his forehead. Not too far different from this self-portrait that he did at that time. In 1599, though, he signed a contract secured for him by Cardinal Del Monte to paint two large paintings for the side walls of the Contarelli Chapel of San Luigi dei Francesi. This was Caravaggio's first major public commission, but it involved bigger paintings than he'd ever done before. They were almost 10 feet square. And the centerpiece was to be the Assumption of the Virgin into Heaven, painted by Annabale Caracci, some 15 years older than Caravaggio, 
And an artist who favoured what Andrew Graham Dixon calls idealised beauty, splendid, splendid colour and lofty transcendence. In other words, a totally different style uh, from the rather sombre depictions of real life in Caravaggio's paintings. And you can imagine the two did not quite see eye to eye. Caravaggio painted the crucifixion of St. Peter to go on the left of the centrepiece and the conversion of St. Paul to go on the right. And he struggled with both and it was only his second attempts at each that was uh, accepted. But this shows the, the three paintings, with, uh, including Caracci's centerpiece, in place in the church. And it also shows what most art historians believe is a painterly insult to Caracci by Caravaggio in that the rump of St. Paul's horse is directly pointing at Caracci's painting. And most modern artists, uh, most artists at the time of Caravaggio, Caravaggio would have understood this as well. The one strikingly different painting at this time is Love Conquers All. But one of his... Uh, rivals started a rumour that the model, who was Caravaggio's assistant, Cecco, also shared his bed. And Caravaggio is reported to have retaliated with insulting verses, which soon led to a court action for libel and Caravaggio being held in jail. And this was at a time in Rome when uh, being found guilty of libel could mean a sentence of between seven years and life in the galleys, and men even asked to be beheaded rather than enduring that. But probably through Del Monte's influence, he was released. Another spot of bother probably led Caravaggio to paint St. Jerome writing as a gift for the Pope's nephew, Scipione Borghese. But now Caravaggio had a significant setback. Several of his commissioned paintings were rejected. This one, the Madonna of Loreto, was turned down by the Church of Sant'Agostino because it showed poor people as pilgrims to the famous shrine of Loreto being rewarded by the Virgin and Child appearing to them when actually the people who donated the, the, and commissioned the painting expected themselves to be shown. And the Madonna del Pala, uh, Palafreniere uh, was rejected by St. Peter's Basilica itself because the model Lena was a known prostitute and she was showing a bit too much cleavage for the Virgin Mary. And the final straw was this painting of the death of the Virgin for the Church of Santa Maria della Scala, rejected once more because the model was recognised as a prostitute. At this time, Andrew Graham Dixon hypothesizes that Caravaggio was supplementing his income by working as a pimp, and he was increasingly becoming involved in fights, and his enmity with another pimp, Ranuccio Tomassoni, who, if you remember, controlled Philidae, spilled over into a probable duel in which Tomassoni was killed, and Caravaggio himself was seriously injured. But killing someone in a duel was a capital offense in Rome, so Caravaggio had to flee, helped by the Marchesa de Caravaggio, Costanza Colonna. He fled to the Alban Hills, to Zagarolo, which was in the middle of the Colonna estates. And while he was there, he painted, but he couldn't afford models other than Cecco, who was still with him. And he sent this painting of David and Goliath to Scipio Borghese, probably to get him to intercede with the authorities on his behalf. The sword blade carries the letters H-O-C-S, which is an acronym for Humilitas Oxidit Superbiam, Humility Overcomes Pride. And this is from St. Augustine's uh, commentary on Psalm 33, which has the words, As David overcame Goliath, this is Christ who kills the devil. And the message is clear. Goliath's head is a portrait of Caravaggio, and he's saying his head is at risk in Rome unless he's pardoned. However, the Tomassoni clan were hunting for him, so he fled further to Naples, where he stayed under the protection of the Colonnas again, probably at Costanza's palace. And like his hometown of Milan, Naples was under Spanish rule, whereas Rome was under the rule of the Pope, so he may have been safer from prosecution. Here he painted the seven acts of mercy for the church of Pio Monte della Misericordia, which was a recently established but fairly wealthy lay fraternity devoted to the care of the sick and needy, and he painted this in seven weeks. And when the building was remodeled 50 years later, a new church was built specifically to give his altarpiece more space and light. And other commission followed. But back in Rome, he was now accused of arranging an attempted murder on one of his rivals, Giovanni Baglioni. He and Caravaggio detested each other. And to rub salt in the wound, Baglioni had recently been knighted as a Cavaliere di Cristo, which is an order of chivalry directly from the Pope. So even if Caravaggio had been able to return to Rome, the thought of his bitter rival lording it over him may have been just too much. So he went to Malta. Well, there may have been some reasons for this, and I'll let you read them.
but to get to Malta he needed permission from the Grand Master for the Order of St John. Luckily for him, two of the people who'd bought his paintings had contacts high up in the order, including a man called Ippolito Malaspina, and one of the first pictures that Caravaggio painted when he got to Malta was St. Jerome writing for Malaspina himself, and Malaspina's coat of arms is in the corner of the painting. By autumn 1607, he'd gone on to paint Martelli, who was a member of the Council of the Order, and by the end of the year, he was painting the Grand Master himself, who was delighted and prepared to admit Caravaggio to the order. But there was a small problem. The only rank he could aspire to was a knighthood of magistral obedience, and this was a, a, a rank that the Grand Master himself had abolished. So he had to, had to write to the Pope for permission to reinstate the honour. The application didn't actually name Caravaggio, instead calling him a, personal, a person of great virtues and merit, but also mentioned that the applicant had killed someone in a brawl. And it's likely the Pope knew exactly who was being referred to. He'd been painted by Caravaggio himself, although this painting is by Raphael, and his nephew, Scipio Borghese, had been in touch with Caravaggio when he'd fled Rome. The application was granted immediately. But now Caravaggio had to pay the passaggio, the admission fee to the order. He had no money, but the new oratory of St. John, attached to the co-cathedral, needed an altarpiece, and a painting was accepted instead, and it was the, be the beheading of St. John. The Grand Master was delighted and gave Caravaggio a gold chain and two slaves. But this is the only painting that Caravaggio signed, in the blood, and it's very proudly signed F. Michelangelo, the F standing for Fra, or brother, which shows that he was a knight of St. John. And that, in his mind, meant that the death sentence hanging over him in Rome could be lifted. But Caravaggio was not aware that becoming a Knight of St. John meant he couldn't actually leave Malta without permission of the Grand Master. And the Grand Master, in his letter to the Pope, had said that Caravaggio was someone he didn't want to lose. But it wasn't long before Caravaggio was in trouble again, and he and some others assaulted a senior member of the order, Fra Giovanni Rodomente Roero, who was seriously injured. And Caravaggio was arrested and thrown into an underground cell, the Guva, in the fort of St. Angelo. It could only be accessed through a trapdoor in the ceiling. And this oval-shaped prison was originally a water cistern, and many people held there had left inscriptions on the walls, as you can see here. Four of the culprits were jailed, and one of the main protagonists with Caravaggio um, was ritually defrocked expelled from the order, and as the words of the Privatio Habitus put it, thrust forth like a rotten and diseased limb from our order and society. But for Caravaggio, they had to do this in absentia, because he'd escaped. He managed to get out of the Guva after a month, climb the fort's ramparts, climb down the outside wall of the fort, and then he probably got into a boat waiting for him and left the island. We've no idea how he planned and executed this, or with whose help and support. All we know is that somehow, soon afterwards, he re-emerged in Sicily unscathed. In Syracuse, he painted the burial of St. Lucy as an altarpiece for the church of Santa Lucia. But the galleys of the Order of St. John were very much in evidence, and it was obvious they were looking for him. He took to wearing a dagger and sword in public, and he slept with his clothes on, and then moved on to Messina, where he painted three more paintings. But his enemies were closing in on him, and after another fracas, he fled from Sicily. This time he went back to the Colonna Palace in Naples. Commissions followed, and feeling safer, he let his guard down. And he made a visit to the Osteria del Cirillo, uh, which was a, a, how can I put it, it was a dive, it was a house of ill repute. Uh, it's now a rather more salubrious restaurant. But on leaving, he was ambushed by four armed men sent by Giovanni Rodimenti Ruero, three to hold him down and one to slash his face. And in the Code of Vendetta, this slashing or sfregio is the traditional punishment for insult to honour or reputation. Andrew Graham Dixon believes that the impact of his weakened state from the serious injuries can be seen in the rather uncertain handling of this painting, which was done soon afterwards, the denial of St. Peter. But whatever the optimist, he thought that his pardon in Rome would soon be in the bag, so he set out for Rome. Unfortunately, he caught a fever and died at the age of 38. He was buried in the, tiny, in the tiny San Sebastiano Cemetery in Porto Ercole, and this cemetery was redeveloped in 1956. And in 2014, his remains were reburied beneath a memorial to him in Porto Ercole.
But a team are 85% sure that they have found his bones, thanks to carbon dating and to DNA matching of people called Marisi in Caravaggio. And these bones had a very high level of lead in them. And this was probably from his paints, because he was known to be very messy with his paints. And the levels were high enough to have affected his behavior. And they may also have been high enough to help to finish him off in his weakened state after the attack. So there we have the story of three exceptional but different artists whose lives were defined by a ceiling, a feast, and more than one fight. But you could argue that Caravaggio had the greatest influence on subsequent artists, such as Rembrandt, Vermeer, Rubens, and Velasquez, because of his use of color scura. So I hope you enjoyed that. My next talk will be on some significant ups and downs in three French people in two days' time. So thank you very much for listening to me.